Good evening, everyone, and good morning to our viewers in Australia, and welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Ari Goldstein with the Office of the President and CEO, and it's my pleasure to introduce the third episode of our new series, Jen Early Speaking, with host Stephanie Butnick, deputy editor at Tablet Magazine and co-host of the leading Jewish podcast, Unorthodox and you should check out if you haven't yet. The intention of this series is to shed light on an aspect of Holocaust memory that often gets overlooked. The experiences of three Gs, or third generation Holocaust survivors, grandkids as survivors. What is it like growing up with a grandparent who lived through the darkest chapter of Jewish history? We're here to explore this question in all of its complex dimensions. With us today from Melbourne, Australia is author and historian David Slukey, whose 2019 book, Sing This at My Funeral, A Memoir of Fathers and Sons, shows how traumatic family histories leave their mark for generations and asks what it means to raise young men in the wake of great suffering. Sluki teaches at the Australian Center for Jewish Civilization at Monash University and recently co-edited the book, Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust. Before we get started, just a quick note that we do have time for audience Q&A throughout the program, so please feel free to submit your comments and questions into the chat box. Without further ado, welcome Stephanie and David. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here tonight or tomorrow morning, depending on where you are uh, right now. Uh, it's tonight for me, it's tomorrow morning for, for David. Uh, but it's really exciting to be here for the third installment of the series all about the third generation or 3G experience. Uh, thank you to Ari and the Museum of Jewish Heritage for having me as the series moderator. And, and as Ari explained, what we're aiming to do here is basically just explore what it means to be the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, uh, to be that third generation for whom the atrocities were, were both a part of history um, and also something that looms quite viscerally large in, in their own lives, in our own lives. Um, and there's really no one better to probe these questions with, um, this strange and powerful legacy, than our guest tonight, David Slokey. He is an, a historian and author. You just sort of heard his bio. But you know, in addition to those books, he's also the co-editor of a collection of stories um, and essays and research by members of this third generation. It's called In the Shadows of Memory. Um, and David, what time is it there? It is 9.04 a.m. and the future looks rainy, I should and say. Based on your accent, I can, you're, in, you're in Melbourne, Australia. That's, that's, cool. that's correct, Melbourne, Australia. Um, so, you know, you're there in Melbourne where you were raised and where a lot of Holocaust survivors uh, restarted their lives and built families. And, you know, I know our audience tonight is telling us where they're coming from. Some of them might actually not be as familiar with um, the world of, of Melbourne Jewry and uh, the particularities of that specific Jewish community. Um, can you tell us a little bit, before we get to you, can you tell us about Melbourne Jews and this sort of post-Holocaust world that was, that was built there? Sure, so the Melbourne Jewish community goes back before the Holocaust, um, but really the, and, and there is new research being done, um, particularly on Melbourne Jews in the 19th century, but um, uh, just for the interest of time, I'll focus on the post-1945 period. The, the Jewish community in Australia basically triples in size after World War II. So um, there is a pretty substantial influx of survivors in the decade and a half after World War II. We're talking, it goes from about just over 20,000 to about 60,000 Jews in Australia in that period. Today, the numbers are somewhere like over 100,000, maybe 120,000, and now roughly split between Melbourne and Sydney. And one of the sort of things that characterizes the Melbourne Jewish community versus Sydney was where the survivors tended to come from. So survivors that came to Melbourne tended to come from Poland after World War II. They were survivors. Um, you know, a lot had survived in the Soviet Union, like many who who did survive generally, um, but you know, also many who had survived under Nazi occupation. Um, and in Sydney, the survivors that tended to go there, and this is not a blanket rule, but um, just a sort of general rule, uh, tended to be from Hungary, Germany. And so they were more West European in kind of outlook attitude than the Jews in Melbourne who were more, um, yeah, it's a bit, maybe a bit insulting to say had more of like a shtetl mentality, but certainly, um, you know, I think that the Jews who came to Melbourne clung very strongly 
uh, in the 1950s and 60s to the kind of Jewishness and Jewish environment in which they'd been raised in interwar Poland. So what you get in Melbourne is this very robust um, community that comes to be dominated, I think, by survivors, at least its institutions come to be dominated by survivors. And, you know, there is a very um, strong concern with the Holocaust, with remembering the Holocaust, um, with establishing organizations and institutions that help toward further that end. Um, but also just help recreate a sense of the world that they felt was lost. So Melbourne has this, in some ways still today, has this flavour of, you know, a community of Polish Jews, um, even though it's it's more diverse than that. You know, there's a substantial um, community of Jews who migrated from South Africa, um, from the former Soviet Union now. Um, but, you know, historically, at least over the last... 70 years, um, yeah, that, that's kind of typified the Melbourne Jewish community. And that's really the environment in which I was raised in the 80s and 90s, still like with a large hangover of this um, Holocaust trauma, I guess. Yeah, I have, a, I have a friend, a former colleague who is from Melbourne and she, you know, people, they sort of re lovingly refer to it as this shtetl, right? This community where all the Jews in Melbourne seem to live in sort of the same area and everything. Yes quite, you know, it's old school in a way that, you know, people from suburban America don't quite get in a way. Yeah, I mean, we all, so, I mean, now more than ever, Melbourne Jews tend to live within two or three uh, city council areas that are adjacent. So not all Jews live in those areas, but the vast majority live within the city of Glen Ira, the city of Port Phillip, and the city of Stonington. And sorry for those uh, joining us from Melbourne who are outside those council areas. But, you know, the, the, it's very, like it used to be that there were pockets in different parts of the city, but now it's all kind of congealed into, you know, one part of town largely. And so that shapes Melbourne Jews, I think, in ways that um, are quite different to the US where you are quite dispersed. You know, even in cities, there are like Jewish neighborhoods or predominantly Jewish suburbs. Um, but Jews are so much more spread out, I think, than they tend to be in Melbourne. Even, you know, it's quite different even to Sydney where, you know, there are sort of Jews across the different sides of the city. Um, in Melbourne, you know, we're really, it, you know, I, when, we were, when we were talking a couple of weeks ago and we, you know, did the Jewish geography and we meant, um, you mentioned a mutual friend we had, and I said, oh, yeah, she lives around the corner from me. And I remember you were just kind of like stunned at that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I said it and I said, oh, you know, my friend Alyssa Goldstein, I used to work with her. Do you know her? And I was so embarrassed as I said it because I was like, this is so obnoxious. Don't tell some person from Melbourne. Oh, do you know this other person from Melbourne? And you were like, she was just over for Shabbos. <laughs> so <laughs> right. it actually sort of proved all of the points in a beautiful, in a beautiful way. Um, so basically, the, this is an invitation for everyone in the comments. Just write people in Australia that you know, and we'll see if David knows them. Um, yeah, yeah. Just anyone you know, I'll see. You know, if, look, if it's someone I know and, you know, there's a bit of a blow, I guess I won't go there. But <laughs> That's for after. Um, right. So let's talk about you and your family. Um, we've obviously already sort of rooted you in, in Melbourne, but I want to sort of go a little, little deeper. You write in your memoir um, here. It's called Sing This at My Funeral. And um, you write that the ghosts of the Holocaust were always hanging around uh, from when you were a child, even to today as a historian and a teacher. So do you remember a time, I mean, this is always sort of my first question here is, when do you remember, when do you realize that something about your family was different? I think the question for you is actually, was there ever a time that you remember not knowing about the Holocaust? No, there was not a time where I didn't know about, where I, I didn't know that I knew about the Holocaust, that I didn't know about the Holocaust. It's always been there, um, as far as I can remember. Um, it was never something that was shielded from us. Um, I don't think it could have been shielded from us. You know, our parents might have tried to not talk about it, although they, they did talk about it. Um, but, you know, like when you grow up, we grew up in an adjacent suburb to my, both my sets of grandparents. All their friends were survivors. You know, if we were going to have any participation or involvement with other Jews in Melbourne, you were going to hear about the Holocaust one way or another. So it was, ne we were never shielded from it. And I don't think my parents would have ever wanted me to be shielded from it. For my dad, it was something very crucial to like 
teach us about it and talk to me and my brother about it uh, all the time. So yeah, it wasn't, um, I, I can't rem- And I think it's the same for my son, you know, he's eight now. Um, and even though he's lived most of his life in South Carolina before we moved back here, um, it, he's always been around it and heard about it and learned about it. So this is one of the complicated questions is, I think we all have it as parents. When do you start talking to your children about stuff like this? Um, so yeah, it was in some ways inevitable to grow up surrounded by the Holocaust and even more so because I went to the Yiddish day school here. I went to the uh, Bundes youth movement, SCIF. So, you know, we were at our grandparents at least once a week, um, sometimes more often. So you kind of just are surrounded by those memories, whether they're talked about or not, they're inevitably there, whether it's the photos of the people who passed away, um, whether it's the frailty of grandparents who are, you know, when I grew up, my grandparents were in their mid to late sixties. And I think about my parents who were, you know, in their mid to late sixties and not frail in the way my grandparents were. So, you know, I can only imagine my grandparents as being in their 80s. Um, so, you know, you're kind of like surrounded by the, the effects of the war, even when it's not spoken about. No, no, that, that definitely makes sense. I mean, because it's, it's sort of like, it's probably how I imagine I ex- existed, right? You sort of remember, no, you see the numbers, there's, it's sort of normal to you but it wasn't mm. normal for all of my friends. Whereas for you, it probably was, it was everywhere in a way. Yeah, I think that that's, that's something particular to not only Melbourne, but Melbourne's probably one of very few places like that where, yeah, it is my experience, but it was also normal. So you asked at the start, you know, when did I realize it wasn't normal to have this kind of story? And, you know, the answer is it always was normal because everyone around me tended to have the same story or worse you know their their grandparents had either gone through the same thing my grandparents had or gone through worse and you know they were all we were it was all just normal to talk about it to think about it it was never um you know some like if an Australian found out and when I say an Australian I mean a non-Jewish Australian um you know they would think that's kind of weird or strange or like I don't know if you've experienced this Stephanie but um, if it ever comes up that your grandparents were survivors and um, someone who's non-Jewish goes, oh my God, I'm so sorry to hear. <laughs> and, you know, my wife and I always laugh about that reaction because it was so normal for us just to like be raised with this. And I think I was, it wasn't until I was an adult, maybe not even until I was in my mid to late twenties that I realized how strange that experience was. Um, you know, like I thought, I think I thought it was just another, another kind of thing to grow up with. Um, But not everyone grows up like, you know, surrounded by those kinds of memories and trauma. I don't know, what was it like for you growing up in in the US? I mean, I grew up on on Long Island in a fairly Jewish area, but, and so it felt like a lot of my friends were Jewish, but not a lot of my friends. I mean, some people had the same thing, but this was sort of this this identity that I felt marked me as very different but you know you were what you were just saying reminded me of something I'd kind of forgotten which is that a, a, a girl who lived in my hall sophomore year of college I went to college in North Carolina um and she was like a very very nice but like very waspy um girl and she was, I guess was in a history class and she came into our room and she was holding some book and she was like did you know about the Holocaust? And she had the book open to the pictures of the people in the barracks and this like these stick figures and these images were so so neutralized to me in a way that I, cause I'm so used to seeing them, but I was just like, mm. oh, you don't know about like this hollow. Like it just was so strange to me that someone who had lived her whole life like, up until college. Um, so maybe not that much of her life, but not even knowing about this thing and, and asking the way she asked me, I was just like a duh. Like I was just sort of like, what do you want me to say here? Yes, of course I know exactly what these photos are. Um, but you know, I guess what's interesting about your experience is that this, this idea you mentioned the Bund, I mean, you have, this other major identity in your family. You guys were Jewish, there was the Holocaust, and I would want to get into your, your grandfather in particular, his story, but this idea of the Bund was this major political grounding force in your lives. And, and, and 
I sort of would just, if you could touch on that quickly, I know you've actually written another book about this, A History of the Jewish Labor Bund after 1945. So like everything we talk wow. about is something that you will have written a book on. Um, <laughs> but you know, you do say something in the book, which is that you sort of felt this nagging sense of shame that you had it so much easier than previous generations in your family. And that sort of led you into this political activism. So can you explain both the, uh, you know, a brief <laughs> explanation of the Bund and then also sure. how function in your family as this other sort of identifying force. So the Bund, just for those who aren't aware, and I'm just shuffling windows around because I keep seeing chat things pop up. So I want to like have it like somewhere within my vision. Um, the Bund was, is, the Bund still exists as, a, as an organization in Melbourne, which is also one of the weird things about um, mine and my friend's upbringing. Um, the Bund was a socialist um, Jewish Workers' Party founded in the Russian Empire in 1897. Um, and, you know, it was a mass party in that context. And then again, in interwar Poland, once the Bolshevik Revolution kind of strangled the Russian Bund. So its center of um, gravity shifted to Warsaw, which is where a few of my grandparents were raised. And they were raised in that context and environment um, around the Bund. And the Bund was one of the most popular um, and in some ways effective, although this is something historians debate, but um, Jewish political movements in the first half of the 20th century. On the eve of World War II, it was competing with the major Jewish parties in Poland for representation on uh, city councils around Poland, on the Kahilas. And it was more or less decimated by World War II. World War II, both by the Nazis who murdered most of the members of the Bund, um, but then also by the Soviet Union. Once communism reached Poland, it was really the end of the Bund in Eastern Europe. So my first book is about how the Bund sort of picked, Bundists picked up the pieces after World War II and then moved to places like Melbourne and Paris and, and New York and reestablished the organization in those contexts. That, that's kind of like a, you know, very crude... <laughs> overall sketch and if there are any historians of the Bund out there they're probably like face palming at how um, I just like skirted over almost everything but so my my two of my grandparents uh, were part of this movement uh, one is complicated but my dad's dad who I write about in the book um, he was born in 1901 and he joins the Bund sometime we think during World War One as a teenager and, you know, threw himself into party work and was really until he died in 1978, a very died in the wall Bundist, um, very committed despite everything that happened to he and his family was a true believer. And that was passed on to my dad. And, you know, my dad was adamant that me and my brother should be raised with those values. So, you know, it was that longer history that was, that shaped our own, political, moral, ethical attitudes. Um, it was also the Holocaust. You know, my, my dad drew ties between his kind of ideological upbringing and values and what his family had experienced. So the lessons that he drew out of the Holocaust were about, you know, I, I mean, he saw it in some ways as a justification for his ideas about socialism and about menschlichkeit, right? This like value about treating other people humanely and um, the holocaust was an important factor in how he thought about um you know treating other people and how society ought to be organized and the kinds of values that he conveyed to us as you know uh, and when i say us i mean me and my brother as human beings as jews um so yeah there, we we grew up with this kind of twin set of um histories that shaped the kinds of values that we had and and not not just values but politics you know and, and i think today my po my political kind of attitudes are still very shaped by that and maybe like can look at it i think with from a thirty thousand foot view a little bit more um, and that's partly because i'm a historian and you know i'm like always have to remind myself to take that bird's eye view of things um but certainly the Holocaust shapes that deeply, um, especially when you couple it with this like glorious Bundist past that, that we try and cling on to.
So can you tell us a little bit um, about your Zeta? I mean, you write, you have this line, I'll stop reading to you from your book at some point, but um, you write that he was so traumatized by what he suffered that he couldn't model how to be a father, so broken that he lived himself into an early grave. Um, that's a really, that's, a, that's the first page of your book. I mean, it's a really haunting description. And I imagine it's not an unfamiliar one to people who are here at this event. I already see sort of one comment from someone who, you know, about these sort of what happens emotionally and psycho psychologically to these survivors. I mean, will you tell us a little bit about your grandfather? Sure, so Zayda was born, Zayda Jakob, um, was born. I, I, I should preface this by saying I never met him. He died before I was born. And so he was this kind of, um, you know, like presence, haunt, I, I would say haunting presence throughout my life because um, I heard a lot about him. My dad talked about him and I was lucky to grow up with three grandparents otherwise. Um, but he, in some ways, because he wasn't there, was this kind of towering um mythical and mysterious figure in a lot of ways. So he was born in 1901 in Warsaw, uh, pardon me. And when I was in Warsaw in November, I went, you know, not the first time I was in Warsaw, but the first time I went with his childhood address and like the streets of Warsaw are overlaid with whatever the city looks like now that sometimes doesn't actually relate to what was there. But I went to the address, Sventoyowska, now I can't remember, 18 or something. Um, and, you know, he, he, his parents died both when he was um, a teenager. His father died um, after being beaten, basically beaten to death by occupying German soldiers in Warsaw. And his mother died um, after being forced to remarry. She fell pregnant and tried to self-abort. And as a complication of that, um, died when he was about 17. So he was orphaned before he was formally an adult, I guess. And he left Warsaw and moved to the town of Wotswavek, which is about 100 kilometers from Warsaw. And as I discovered, a very smooth, easy drive on the new EU freeways that connect all the Polish cities. <laughs> um, so Wotswavek is a city of about 100,000 or so and so much smaller, about 10% Jewish. And by that stage, he joined the Bund. He got married in the middle of the 1920s to a, another Bundist. And they had two children, Shmulek and Chaim. Shmulek was named after his father who had, who had died during World War I. And yeah, they lived, you know, kind of this working class Jewish life. He was a bookkeeper. Um, a party activist in Wotswavek. When the war broke out in 1939, uh, they initially decided to stay in Wotswavek. They thought probably um, it wasn't safe to go to the Soviet Union, especially because they were Bundists and, you know, Bundists and communists were hostile to each other. So Bundists in the Soviet Union got either thrown in prison or sent to Siberia. Um, so they didn't think it was safe to go to the Soviet Union, which many Polish Jews were doing at the time. Eventually they decided that he should go, that uh, as a socialist and an activist within his town, that he would probably get targeted by the Nazis. And they thought at the time that, you know, it was probably safe for women and children to stay. They didn't think, you know, no one really could have predicted the extent of the Holocaust at the time. So they decided that he would flee and because he was in danger. And so on November 22nd, 1939, he hopped on a train and went east. And within a few days, he was across the border in the Soviet Union. In the middle of 1940, he tried to return to Wotswavek. Um, he, he'd been writing letters back and forth and we have the letters that his wife, Gittel, had sent to him in the Soviet Union um, which don't say a lot because of censorship, um, but they're an incredible artifact. So he was tried to cross back into Poland and he was arrested by the Soviet border guards, seen as a kind of an enemy combatant because Poland and the Soviet Union at the time were enemies. Um, and he was sent on a train east and spent the next few months on a train to Siberia where they arrived in a small deportee settlement called Minor. It's not even on a map, but it's 
hundreds of kilometers, oh, sorry, a couple of thousands of kilometers past Yakutsk. So for anyone out there who's ever played the, the board game Risk, you know where Yakutsk is. That's like the people's only point of reference for Yakutsk. It's way east. So it's basically like in the gold mining regions that Solzhenitsyn wrote about in his novels. So they spent their time there when they were released in sometime mid to late 1941. Uh, they tried to come back, but he was had all his stuff stolen from him and he had no money. So they settled in, in Yakutsk for a couple of years. Um, my grandmother, who was not married to him then, she was just a teenage late teenager worked as his secretary when he was a bookkeeper. Um, they lived there in Yakutsk. When the war looked like it was wrapping up, they managed to make their way back west and they landed in um, Western Russia in a city called Saratov for a couple of years. And that's where he discovered that his wife and sons had been murdered at Khalno, at the Khalno extermination camp. So they'd been rounded up in April 1942 and deported on trains to the nearby Khalmok camp where they were murdered in the backs of gas vans. So he was broken, um, obviously. And in 1946, they returned to Poland. And on the way, he married my grandmother. Um, they tried to resettle. They were sent to Vro uh, Wrocław. And, and they realized there wasn't a future for Jews in Poland. You know, they were conscious of the anti-Semitism. They had passed through Kielce, the town where a pogrom took place in July, 1946. And in, at the end of 1947, they went to Paris where they waited for their visas to come to Australia. And in 1950, they made it to Melbourne where, you know, they, they lived in the one place for the longest that they had lived in their lives. Um, Zayda lived in Mel Melbourne until he died 28 years later, and that was as long as he'd lived anywhere. That's the story in a, you know, in, in a snapshot. Well, then, I mean, your father gets the name of either his murdered half-brother or his murdered grandfather, right? Right. So the, story, the family story was that he was named after his grandfather, Shmuel, or Shmulek. And, you know, I just don't buy it. <laughs> Like, I think, or, or at least it doesn't matter, you know, whether or not he was named after his grandfather or his murdered half-brother. The reality is he carried the name Shmulek his whole life, and that must have been some kind of burden to carry. You know, like, naming is a really powerful... So I don't... There's a truck outside my window, and I don't know if it's making a lot of noise through the... I don't hear it. Speakers. Oh, good, it. okay. This is a crash. Um, they will tell you if they hear it. That's the best. Good, 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 okay. <laughs> Usually they'll just um, tell you if you're not talking loud enough, but we can't do we can't do that here. <laughs> right. This is um yeah in 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 Yiddish Melbourne the shout is always a bissel hacher mechanisch tagen, which means like a bit louder we can't hear, <laughs> and usually that's from the front row. Um, so yeah, this act of naming I think is a powerful thing. You know, you you sort of say a lot about what you hope for your children based on what you name them, particularly if you're naming them after people who have gone before. And so, um, oh, thank you, Erica, for the really kind comment. That means yeah, a lot. Pretty good. Um, the, so yeah, dad was named, you know, I maintain that he was named after Shmulek, after his half brother, um, whether or not it was conscious. Um, because my Zeta was um, broken by what happened to his family. You know, I discovered these letters that he had written to his brother in Los Angeles and we kind of knew about them. And I went and found them in my dad's cousin's garage. Um, and, you know, they're written between 1946 and 1978, right near to when he died. And he just pours his heart out in these letters. I mean, incredibly uh, moving descriptions of just how he felt you know through the 1960s talking about being broken being in a straitjacket that he should be committed to a mental hospital he said um and i just think how could it be otherwise that he looked at my dad every day whose name was schmulek and didn't how could he not think of his son and how his son was murdered 
and he had such high hopes, you know, like he writes in the letters about Schmulek was really good at school. He was very dedicated to the Bund, Bund children's movement skiff. He was very worldly and could talk about world politics. And, you know, my dad, this was a burden for my dad. I think, you know, my dad, he died when my dad was, Zeta died when my dad was 30. And it, my dad became like a very distinguished uh, drama teacher and very renowned in Australia. And Zeta never saw that. What Zeta saw was my dad couldn't settle down, couldn't figure out what he wanted. My dad was a hippie who traveled around the world. And, you know, I imagine smoked a lot of pot <laughs> and to my, and had long hair, you know, and this was like a source of tension between he and, he and his father. And I think this was a huge burden for dad to carry this name. And for also for Zeta who like, projected all of that stuff that you know unfulfilled potential of the first schmulek onto the second schmulek i mean it's a it's an enormous burden dad didn't really talk about it but it was there i think you know something that has come up so often in these in these conversations is this idea of, like the emotional trauma of the of the second generation right for that person to be your parent and to be so close to what had happened We've, we've studied it, we've written about it, we've read about it, right? Um, the third generation is, is really a little bit different, right? Because, you know, obviously there is a fourth generation, you have a son, this, the third generation is not, you know, our children anymore. But there's a way in which that distance, right? You're, you never met your Zeta. Like you could approach him almost as a historian and a little bit with a little bit of distance that your father and his siblings never could. I mean, you know, we've already have a few questions rolling in about this idea, like, what ha what is the difference between the second generation and the third generation um my my i have my grandparents are here tonight uh alan cecile they're my maternal grandparents they're amazing um my paternal grandparents my father's parents um were holocaust survivors and died when i was about three and four so again like i didn't know them in any real way i have memories of them i think or or their memories based on photographs or, or videos right. but it's so different when you've actually not known these people and the edges are a little softer, right? But by that point for the third generation. And I think you can kind of like project what you want onto them. So you can make them what you want them to be. And I think, you know, I don't know if you, you did this with your grandparents, but certainly with my Zeta, um, I could make him what I wanted him to be. And he could be that um, whatever fit, you know, when I was like, when I think about, myself or when I maybe used to and maybe less so now but when I used to think about myself as very politically radical and fiery and I'd be like oh yeah just like my Zeta because that's what my dad described him as and I would kind of like create him in this particular kind of image so yeah I think not knowing him is complicated but the second third generation thing I think like the obvious difference and and probably you you see this too a difference between you and, and your parents like we didn't grow up in a house with Holocaust survivors, mostly. So we didn't grow up hearing our parents screaming in their nightmares, or we didn't grow up with their like very strange quirks. Like we saw glimpses of them when we'd go visit or when we, you know, like I'd sleep over at my grandparents' house as a kid. And there are ways that their personalities come to weigh on you, the ones that are there, but you didn't, like you weren't raised by people who were damaged in that way, you know, like they're damaged in their own way. Sorry, sorry, Mish, <laughs> who's out there, you know, like it, I think there is something traumatizing also about being the child of survivors and growing up with, with that trauma, like you're surround, that doesn't mean you're traumatized by the Holocaust, but you do experience some, and I'm a historian, not a psychologist. So you know, I'm not, this is not a psychological diagnosis. Um, but it is to say, you know, when you grow up and you're raised, but you know, cause parents are so influential, obviously on the person you become, uh, it, can't, it can't, but impact on you in really deep ways. My dad was very well adjusted. Um, you know, I think the cliche about second generation people is the kind of art Spiegelman in mouse figure who is, you know, very neurotic and damaged and has this strained relationship with their parents. And I don't know if that's 
and I think a lot of second generation literature kind of grows out of that image of what it means to be second generation. Um, but my dad and, and a lot of the people I know are in spite of that very well adjusted and you know, they, they can't always take, like my dad couldn't take his father in cues from his father because his father was 47 when he was born and was basically like a 70 year old and couldn't be the type of father that my dad wanted to be. So he had to kind of model in many ways, his parenting against how his own father was. Not that he, you know, he was very loving and, and caring, but he couldn't be there for him. He worked 16 hours a day. And my dad always used to say, you know, he never came and watched me play a football match once. Um, and my dad was the opposite of that. He was there constantly. He was at everything. He would come and watch me at, fo- at practice and give me feedback on practice. So, you know, I think the second generation, and the difference between second and third generation is our engagement with these memories is so filtered and mediated often through our parents' experience, we've benefited from it. Like they've been the front line of that. That means once we receive this Holocaust memory and, and knowledge, you know, it's kind of refracted already and we can kind of ease into it a bit more. We can ask questions at our own pace, at our own level of interest. We can ignore it if we want to ignore it. And we can engage with it in the ways that we want. And also, sorry, I'm just, more things that come to me as I talk. Um, we can ask our grandparents in ways that our parents often didn't feel like they could, you know, like I ask my mum, and she, once again, she's out there. So miss just comment in the chat if I'm misrepresenting this. Um, but I asked my mum, like, what did Bubba used to tell you? I mean, my Zayda never talked generally, so he never talked about anything. He was very quiet, but I, I asked what did Bubba used to talk about when she was in the Soviet union during the war? And she said, I never asked her. I never thought, you know, like for whatever reason, it never occurred to her to ask questions. And I think for us as third generation people, it becomes a bit more urgent as they get older, as they, you know, like we grow up with them as mortals. And when you're a kid, your parents are kind of immortal. And so when you're dealing with frail older people and realizing that, hey, they don't have long on this earth, I think there's more of an impulse to ask questions than the people you just grow up with and who, you know, change your nappies and whatever. Diapers, sorry, for the Americans out there. <laughs> nappies. Um, I think that's I think that's that's right. I mean, what we often hear even in these chats is like, just didn't seem right to ask. It didn't want to traumatize them. I don't like it was so real and so near, um, or at least it felt that way that you couldn't. I mean, the thing that's so fascinating to me about the three G's, and you you know, have a lot of experience with this, you edited a whole collection of, of, of stories and, and essays and things like that by the third generation. Um, you know, this idea of having to find these stories out ourselves, right? Either uh, the survivors are not here anymore, either they didn't talk about it, either your family just accepted as a rule that no one was gonna talk about it. What we hear is actually people who seek out these stories, who, who do what you did, who find those letters, who do their own research and basically make their, these stories their own. and. What it usually brings you to is at some point in the story, you go back, right? You go back to Poland, you go back to Germany. And, and for you, I'm curious, when you go back to Poland, right, in the book, what, what happens? You sort of say that Australia is your home, but wonder, you wonder what is your homeland? And this weird thing has happened where we don't have a connection to my grandparents, um, my dad's parents were both from Poland. No one wanted me to go back to Poland to go search and find their homes. There was no idea that like reclaiming anything. And I think that what we want actually is to know where we come from. And yeah. this weird erasure has happened where, especially almost in Poland, almost probably to the same degree in Germany, you, this idea like the older generations are like, why would you go back there? But we yeah. want to claim something, right? I mean, what was it like for you? Did you go back? Yeah, I spent a That's summer so um, on a fellowship in Poland and it was intense and weird. And afterwards I stayed on and I went to the town where my father's family was from. And I'm oh, sorry, this is my cat. He's, he's having his, <laughs> his evening Just stretch. stretching out. Very it's, long, it's very sweet. <laughs> very long day. Um, but yeah, I went back because I wanted to feel, I wanted to connect to something. I feel like American Jews don't have these homelands. Like the, we speak of the old country in a very metaphorical way. No one actually wants to go back there. But I wanted to know where did these people who I, barely know where did they live what, what did it look like um and 
it was surprising. I think that that's happened. I mean, there's this real resurgence of Jewish life in Poland. Um, that's fascinating. And you sort of have to go to see it and not just on March of the Living, which is, you know, not the best way to right. see things. It's also different to the, like this resurgence of Jewish life in Poland in many ways bears very little resemblance to what you and I were seeking when we went back there. Yeah. Like it is wonderful to see, and it's just this incredible story. Um, but it also is kind of disconnected in some, like it's connected because of geography. Um, but I think culturally, historically, it, it's, it feels remote in some ways, I think. Um, I, I've been back a few, t- I, I always say I've been back. You know, I, I talk about going back to Poland. Um, I yeah, talked to, I, right. I mean, I thought about it that way when I first went there and I'd never been there. And it seemed like a really strange way to think about it, like to return somewhere I'd never been. And I went the first time in 2003, I was 19 on a bus tour through Europe. Um, we were living in London at the time and we did one of these like Kentucky style tours with a bus full of Australians and Kiwis just getting drunk constantly. Like, you know, one euro for a can of beer on the bus. So um, that, that was the kind of nature of that trip. But we chose that one because it went through Poland and we were like, this is a good opportunity. We don't know when we're going to come back to Europe. Um, so we did it, we did it that way. And it was a, obviously a weird way to do it. Um, and you didn't have a lot of flexibility because you go to like Krakow and Auschwitz and Warsaw and then on to Berlin. So I didn't get to like go see the, you know, the, whatever the, the towns where my grandparents were from necessarily, although Warsaw was part of it. Um, and I think I was too young to really understand the gravity of it and to really like consider the meaning of doing that. I just knew that that's where my grandparents were from. That's where all the, the the center of the Holocaust story took place. And that's where I got to go. I went again in 2012 for a conference and it was just after my first book had come out. And I was very like conscious then of like, I'm in Warsaw, the place where my grandparents were born and raised and it has this uh, enormous emotional significance. And I walked the streets in this very earnest way and, you know, sang the um, Bundest anthem at the cemetery with a bunch of other scholars who were there. And, you know, it was all very meaningful. And I visited my grand, my great grandfather's grave in Warsaw, which was wild. If anyone's been to the Warsaw Jewish cemetery, you know how like complicated and massive it is. And his grave is in like a back corner somewhere. And this amazing guy just like raced through and found it, um, which was really, really quite cool. I went again in November um, to talk about this book. And I went to Wrocław where they lived for a couple of years and where the first handful of letters were written. And as my dad always used to say, where he was conceived, he always used to say conceived in Poland, born in Paris so I went to Rotswab, which is this amazing city and everyone should go visit it. Um, and then I drove up to Chelno, uh, where his family was murdered and to Wrocławek where he lived and to Warsaw. And I kind of did this reverse tour of Europe from, from where they lived, um, kind of going backwards in time in a way. And it was incredibly powerful to, you know, I read the letters in Yiddish out loud to audiences in the places where he wrote them in the places where he grew up and it's hard to describe the feeling you get kind of doing that it's it almost feels cheesy to say actually um because i'm i'm normally cynical about these kind of things but to go back and step you know i sat outside the apartment building that they lived in in wrocław i walked the streets that might have been where he walked uh, as a child, um, I didn't have an address in Wrocławek, but, you know, I walked around what was the Jewish quarter and imagined walking in those footsteps. And I journaled furiously, you know, it was below freezing and I sat on the banks of the Vistula River in Wrocławek and my fingers were freezing and I was like, I have to write about this. Um, And it was, yeah, it was incredibly powerful to do. And I don't know that I felt this sense of home. Um, You know, in some ways I'm very conscious of being like a settler in Australia, you know, which is a settler colony. 
a place where um, sovereignty over the land was never ceded. Um, and so, you know, I have this kind of ambivalence about my place in Australia. And also this ambivalence about my connection to Poland, you know, who my grandparents said the same thing as you described. Why would you go back to such a shitty country? My grandmother said to me when I was first going to Poland. And so I, you know, there's this, I think one of the things, and I don't know if this is a third generation survivor thing particularly, or if it's a, um, you know, being a child of refugees thing. Um, but you kind of have this ambivalence about where you live and where you're from all at the same time. And then I lived in the U S for seven years and I felt this like triple ambivalence about where I lived. Cause I lived in South Carolina, which is, you know, in so many ways, wonderful and so deeply complicated and just rife with a difficult history and to feel implicated in that, the dark side of that history as a white person um, and a settler was unsettling, I think. And so, and, and particularly, you know, coming from this story of like Holocaust survival and the sort of triumph of being a descendant of survivors to then be part of the mechanism of that oppresses indigenous people, people of color, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing to navigate sort of intellectually and emotionally. Um, it's, and I think it's just an ongoing work in progress. How, I mean, how, does, how do you feel as like the granddaughter of survivors who lives in this sort of um, deeply racially divided country, especially you know, now? It's, it's complicated. I mean, I, I said this as, mu as much on our podcast on Orthodox when we were sort of grappling with everything that's been going on this summer. I, my honest feeling is it's so strange because I'm in some ways I so identify as this idea with this, not victim, but with this, this suffering, right? With this, this history. I mean, this idea that what had been done to my family because they were Jewish and that being so much a part of what I do professionally. I mean, this, I work in a Jewish magazine. I've sort of dedicated this so much of my time and energy to sort of like thinking about the Holocaust and studying and the third generation. But then to also at the same time be able to hold the fact that like I am part of the status quo in this country, right? I am privileged, I am white, whatever that means, even though for Jews it's complicated, but to sort of be able to hold both of those things at once is a challenge. I think that a lot of Jews are sort of opening opening their, their minds to. I mean, the funny thing about my American experience is I always joke that we sort of have that like bags packed mentality of like, yeah. we're safe nowhere. But if I actually think about it, if I'm not safe here, where, you know, if there is no place to go back to, I mean, that, that actually is a very unsettling thought that I sort of hadn't really considered till tonight. Um, but this idea of, you know, it's sort of like uh, an itinerant I, life, life, even though I've, my family is here, you know, it's, I'm always, I'm always so fascinated when people's families have been in the United States for like more than two generations. I think of them as like basically like DAR, you know, like this idea, like you, oh, you've been here forever. Um, but but this is also most American Jews, right? Like the majority of American Jews, their families have been there for more than two generations. Yeah. It's like what a luxury, like, this idea. <laughs> right. And to feel so deeply rooted in that place and to feel a sense of being part of that story, you know, it must be difficult. I mean, I, I feel this about Australia and I, you must feel it about America too. Like I don't feel part of the story necessarily of Australia. I feel part of a particular version of the story that celebrates immigration and diversity, um, but not part of the longer story. You know, like at the big national holiday here every year is Anzac Day, which memorializes the landing of Australian and New Zealand troops in, um, in Turkey in 1915. And it was a military defeat, but you know, I'm not, I don't feel part of that story. Not because I'm Jewish, because like one of the most important World War One generals was John Monash, who was Jewish. Um, but because like our story in Australia starts later than that and is kind of disconnected from that story of Australian patriotism and, um, you know, like we, we're deeply Australian. I shouldn't, I shouldn't give a false impression. Like, you know, uh, we watch the football every Australian rules football by the way, every week and, you know, grew up playing cricket and I had Vegemite on toast for breakfast and what, like we're, you know, we're part That's of this. Like we imagined. Too. 
Right, exactly. A terrible cliche. And I, you know, I rode a kangaroo to school every every morning. Um, the pouch. Yeah, inside the pouch. <laughs> so, no, I, you know, I, despite that, though, there's, and I think probably again, it was was not till I was an adult till I realised the the strangeness of my position with regard to Australian society because I went to a Jewish primary uh, elementary school in, in American. Um, you know, I was surrounded by Jews so much, uh, even though like we had non-Jewish friends and we participated with non-Jews in other ways. But, um, you know, there, there was this process, I guess, as I got older of like, oh, this is a bit strange to be, to not be like part of this project of Australia, whatever that means, or to feel like what, you know, you've got one foot in and one foot out the door. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm thinking right now is like the, the Tree of Life shoot, of shooting in 2018. I think for a lot of Jews of my, I mean, for a lot of Jews in America, that was the first time which America felt like a scary place, um, like yeah. a this really scary place. Um, and suddenly all these things that we had been talking about all the time felt more real. Um, but I don't, I sort of want to know, I mean, I want to bring this forward a little bit, right? You have an sure. eight-year-old son. He is the fourth generation. He knew your dad a little bit. He, right, your dad died. Yeah, he was, was he was three when dad died. So, so he says he remembers dad and, and it's feasible because he has a brilliant memory, like not quite photographic, but almost photographic memory. So I partly believe him when he says he remembers my dad. Um, but we talk about him a lot and he, we got photos around so, and we show him videos. So it's hard to know. It's hard to separate. This is the part of what I explore in the book. Like, it's hard to separate what you actually remember and what you've received and incorporated into what you remember. So, I mean, you, you dedicate this, this memoir to him. Um, you, you, then you describe what it is as a difficult legacy. I mean, how do you, you've spent so much of your life grappling with this, this enormity of, of loss and of survival and all of the mix of emotions and psychological implications. And now it's sort of your job to, to, to pass that to the fourth generation. I mean, how do you even begin to grapple with that? And, and you know, there was a question in the, in the thread about sort of like what's gained and lost when the, these stories are told from the third generation perspective. I mean, we can even extrapolate that, that out more. I mean, what do you think your son, is, is your son gonna go back to Poland and try to see? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to go with him to Poland. I think that's something that I would have liked to have done is to, go, to have gone with my parents to Poland. And so Mish, when lockdown's all over, we're gonna do that sometime, okay? Um, I hope she's still here and hasn't like stormed out. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would like to do stuff like that with him. We, we, he, we've talked about like going to, traveling to Europe when he finishes high school and doing the, he wants to do the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Um, and, like the thing about Arthur, his name's Arthur. The thing about Arthur is he is very bright and he's been reading from a very young age and he's always liked encyclopedias since he started reading. So he had this history encyclopedia and when he was three, um, you know, I remember the moment walking through Hampton Park on some um, charity walk and he was in the stroller and he had his encyclopedia because we thought we're going on a charity walk and he's not going to, he's not going to walk with us for five miles or however long we walked. And so he is reading and he turns to the world war two page and you know, there's a big picture of a swastika and next one, a big picture of Hitler. And I remember just thinking, excuse my French. I remember thinking fucking hell. <laughs> what now? Like, what do I do now? Yeah, like how that do we? Was not how you're planning to spend that day, basically having that conversation. Exactly. Yeah. So how do I? You know, like he's three, so he has no frame of reference. Like he understands the words, and he has like a basic sense of timeline because he's reading a, an encyclopedia. But, um, you know, he. It, it was a question like, how do we do this now? And our policy, my wife and, and my policy has always been not to bullshit him, you know, to sort of treat him like a human being who can handle complexity and difficult information and, you know, try and convey things in an age appropriate way, but also 
just it's going to be part of his story. He's going to know that this is part of his story. And he's, if he's old enough to read about Hitler, then he actually has to know that he's connected to that story as well. So, you know, we've been talking to him about it in various ways. When, when I started writing this book, he became deeply interested in it. And cause he was just, you know, he'd sit with me in the coffee shop and he'd be like writing some, we had writers retreats together and he'd write stories about Winnie the Pooh and I would write about, I'd, I'd be writing this book. So he'd sit next to me and look over my shoulder and say, what are you writing about? So we've talked about it all the time. You know, there are things that I would, uh, that I do that I wouldn't, that ha what happened to me as a child, I wouldn't subject him to in the same way so and i think the way we think about these things is different so when i was growing up in the 80s and early 90s and we would have a holocaust memorial assembly at school and the school would blacken the windows and put up picture like big blown up pictures of the warsaw ghetto and of maps showing where the railroads went and you know i they don't do that. Or when I went to skiff camp and we had um, ghetto day every year and they would like simulate death marches and stuff. I mean, just bizarro stuff that I don't think anyone's proud of having done. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't want to teach him in some of the ways that I was taught, but I also don't want to like shield him from this reality that this is part of his story. And hopefully, you know, we never have to enjoy anything like what our grandparents endured or oh, for him, great grandparents. But, you know, in terms of understanding his place in the world and why we do what we do, why I do what I do for a living, why we talk about things in particular ways. Like, I think it's important for him to learn that, like, as he's ready for it. And so, yeah, we, we try not to like browbeat him with it, but, you know, answer the questions that get asked and, yeah, hopefully just not traumatize him too much. So we just figure like he's going to be traumatized in yeah. some way yeah. or another. We're, we're screwing up. him up. <laughs> so you talked before about the importance of naming. My last question to you, um, what, how, did you, how did you name your son? Who did you name him after? So his, na his name is Arthur Manny Slukey. And he, he, I'll start with his middle name, Manny. He was born in um, March 2012 and my grandmother whose name was Manya had died in I guess November the previous year when uh, Helen was pregnant when when Bubba died and we knew we wanted to honor her um, and we didn't quite know how like we we're obviously not going to name Arthur Manya because um, <laughs> that's of a particular time and place and it would have sounded strange on a little boy in Melbourne, Australia. So we came up with Manny as a kind of way to, to honor her. Um, but the name that we really liked, and I think to an extent I like Imposer's story on this, but we liked the name Arthur. Um, we liked these kind of old English type names. Um, but I was adamant that the name that we gave him had to also have some kind of significance and meaning. It couldn't just be a name we liked. Cause I, yeah, I, I guess in, to some extent, I've always thought naming is an important thing. When I was a kid, I was always a bit jealous of my brother because my brother's name is Jacob after our grandfather. And like, that was a significant thing. I don't know if he thinks it's a burden. He would never say if, if he did think that. Um, and I was always jealous because my name was David. And I'd say to my parents, like, why did you name me David? Like, oh, we like the name. I was like, well, that's, that's a bit shit. He gets to be named after someone. And I'm kind of like, you know, so I, I think I always thought that. Um, so uh, we liked the name Arthur, but I think what, what sort of sealed the deal was, you know, there was this figure, uh, Arthur Ziegelboim, who was a Bundesleader, um, originally in the Warsaw Ghetto, and then he represented um, the Bund in the Polish government in exile in London. And one of his tasks as the Bund's representative was to try and convey the information from the Polish underground um, that was coming out of the Polish underground and convey that to world leaders in London. Um, so when they ha heard news about Treblinka, um, you know, his 
what he tried to do is lobby the governments of the world along with other Jewish leaders to actually take notice and do something about it. And in May 1943, um, he committed suicide in protest to the world's indifference um, to, the, to the experience of Jews. So, you know, he's always, that's all, like Ziegelboim has always been a kind of um, towering figure in our, the stories that we tell about the Holocaust in our family and community. Like I grew up with a, um, in the, the Bund's headquarters, there's always been a big picture of him framed on the wall, sort of staring down. So that, you know, that sort of ticked a lot of boxes. And, you know, when people say, well, who was he named after? I say, well, he's named after this Jewish leader who committed suicide in 1943. And it's like, that's really screwed up thing to do to your kid. <laughs> Um, but I think also there's something, you know, there's a bit of gravity that I hope that he takes out of that one day that he realizes, you know, that, that there are some kind of, he derives some values out of what we named him and also sees himself connected to this longer history. So yeah, that, that's the long version of why we named Amazing. him that. I would right. expect nothing less from a historian, from a 3G. I mean, you've got it all, you like built it all in there. Um, David Saluki, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Where can we like find out more about you? Where can everyone go um, and, and buy your book? So um, it depends where you are in the world. Uh, an easy thing is Amazon. Um, but if you want to buy from a local bookseller, um, you can just call your local bookseller and they can get it in from a supply. You can go on the Wayne State University Press website. Um, they sell it there. Um, yeah, like on Barnes and Noble's website and stuff, you can get it too. If you're in Australia, the easiest thing is, if you're in Australia, it's probably because you know me and you have the book, but just in case you're in Australia and you don't, um, the best place is probably um, Angus and Robertson online or Amazon online. Um, and yeah, otherwise, um, oh, and Ari's put a link to it there. Um, yeah, otherwise you can look at my website and see my other work and um, yeah, I'm out there. <laughs> and yeah, feel free if you like want to communicate with me. Um, Ari, if you wouldn't mind, you're welcome to put my email address in the, in the chat and feel free to send me an email and continue the conversation. Absolutely, let me pull it up here. Um, Stephanie and David, thank you so much on behalf of the museum for this uh, transcontinental, meaningful 3G conversation. Um, I should just mention, David, I don't know if you know, we have Shmuel Ziegelboim's eyeglasses in the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I'd say it's, a, you know, you walk through a museum exhibition and there's hundreds of artifacts and it's easy to miss them. And I think in a Holocaust exhibition, eyeglasses are easy to miss because there's so many like artifacts that are clothing that people left at camps, but these ones really have a powerful story. So for those of you who are able to visit, when we reopen, uh, recently announced for September 13th, uh, you should come check it out. Um, David, we so appreciate you taking the time to share your both your personal and your scholarly perspectives with us, and Stephanie for being our uh, ever gracious host of the Generally Speaking series. Uh, to everyone who's watching, make sure to check out Tablet Magazine's uh, podcast Unorthodox for more interviews by Stephanie and her co-hosts with interesting Jews and non-Jews from all walks of life. Tonight's program was recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel in the next day or so. We'll send out a follow-up email including, including the link to the recording to all of the program registrants tonight. If you liked this program, please consider making a donation to the Museum of Jewish Heritage or becoming a member or joining our next program, or all of the above. Uh, our next program is this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. It's a book talk with author Larry Ty about his new book, Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. You can find info about Thursday's program and support the museum's work at our website, which is www.mjhnyc.org. Thank you again, Stephanie and David and everyone who's joining. Have a good evening. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks, Stephanie, for the wonderful conversation. I appreciate yeah. it. And hi, mom. <laughs> yes, hi to my mom and hi to, I'm just gonna quickly rattle off names. Hi to Bronya and Erica and Avi and Emma. And who else do I know? Sorry if I missed you. <laughs> all right, that's all I can say. And Katka, that's all I got. <laughs>
Well, my mom's not here, but it sounds like she should be. <laughs> we'll send her the recording. And you all should send your moms the recording when we send out <laughs> the follow-up email tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.